assembled here. <laughs> I first want to renew my thanks to all who have made it possible, to Jack and his committee, to each one of you, to the untold miles of travel that you've all made to be present, to inspire me, to fill me with the warmth of your hospitality be with each other. I'm grateful to the governor of this state, the mayor of this town, for their recognition that we are again not only a member, but citizens of the world. We once more belong, so these friends have said. I'm deeply grateful to this hotel. <coughs> and the owners of it, who have housed us, especially me, so superbly. Could you see that apartment I'm in, you'd wonder how the hell anybody could stay sober in it. It has bars. <laughs> As for me, I came here in great gratitude, not only for the many tokens of your generosity and affection that I have received in the past, but for what you are making possible for my sponsor, Ebby, just as much the founder of AA as I, or any of the score without whom this thing couldn't have been. So again, <coughs> I record my deep gratitude, and I can find no better words to say it in. I think I'm on the bill for tonight's show with a talk on the tradition, the 12 traditions of AA. But you know drunks like women uh, have the prerogative, or at least seize the prerogative, of changing their mind. Don't make any such thing. Since this is a banquet, something very festive, I think the traditions, 1 to 12, would be a little too grim. My for you a little. As a matter of fact, uh, speaking of traditions, uh, when they were first written back there in 1945 or 6, it was a sort of tentative guide to help us to hang together and function. Nobody play, paid any attention except a few againers who wrote me what the hell mail about it. Nobody paid the slightest attention. <laughs> but little by little, as these traditions uh, got around, and we had our club, clubhouse squabbles, our group riffs, this difficulty and that, it was found that the traditions indeed did reflect experience and were guiding principles. So they took all a little more, and a little more, and a little more, so that today the average AA coming in the door learns at once what they're about, what kind of an outfit he really has landed in, by what principles his group and AA as a whole are governed. But as I say, the Dickens with all that. I'd just like to spin some yarns, and they will be a series of yarns which cluster around the preparation of the good old book, Alcoholics Now. Some people reading the book now, they say, well, this is the AA Bible. And when I hear that, it always makes me shudder because the guys who put it together weren't a damn bit biblical. <laughs> I think sometimes, you know, the drunks have an idea that these old-timers went around with the almost visible halos and long gowns, and they were full of sweetness and light. And, oh, boy, how in 
fire they were. Oh, yes. But wait till I tell you. I pulled the book yarn really started in the living room of uh, Doc and Annie Smith. As you know, I landed there in the summer of 35. A little group caught hold. I helped Smithy briefly with it, and he went on to found the first AA group in the world. And as with all new groups, it was nearly all failure. But now and then, somebody saw the light, and there was progress. Tampered, I got back to New York, a little more experience, the group started there. And by the time we got around to 1937, the thing had leaked a little over into Cleveland and it began to move south in New York. But it was still, we thought in those years, of flying blind, a flickering candle indeed that might at any moment be snuffed out. So on this late fall afternoon in 1937, Smithy and I were talking together in his living room and sitting there by the gas log. And we began to count notes. How many people had stage drive in X, in New York, maybe a few in sleep, issues of alcoholism, stage dry, and for how long? And when we added up that score, Sure, it was a handful. I don't know, 35, 40 maybe. But enough time had elapsed on enough really fatal cases of alcoholism so that when we grasped the import of these small statistics, Bob and I saw for the first time that this thing was going to succeed. That God in his providence and mercy had thrown a new light into the dark caves where we and our kind had been and were still by the million dwellers. I never can forget the elation and ecstasy that seized this book. And then we fell happily talking and reflecting. We reflected that, well, a couple of score of them, but this had taken three long years. There had been an immense amount of failure, but a long time had been taken just to sober up the handful. How could this hand carry its message to all those who still didn't know? Not all the drunks in the world could come to Akron or to New York. How could we transmit our message to them? By what means? Maybe we thought we should go to the old timers in each group, which then meant nearly everybody find the sum of money, somebody else's money, of course, and say to them, well, now take a sabbatical year off your job, if you have any, and you go to Keokuk and to Omaha and to Chicago and to San Francisco and to Los Angeles and wherever it may be, and you give this thing a year and get a group start. It had already got evident by then, for we were just about to be moved out of the city hospital in Akron to make room for people with broken legs and ailing livers. But the hospitals were not too happy with us. We tried to run their business perhaps too much, and besides, drunks were apt to be noisy in the night, and there were other inconveniences, which were all familiar. So it was obvious that uh, drunks being such unlovely creatures we would have to have a great chain of hospitals. And as that dream burst upon me, it sounded good, because, you see, I had been down in Wall Street in the promotion business. And I remember 
the great sums of money that were made uh, as soon as people got this chain idea, you know, the chain drug store, the chain grocery store, the chain dry, dry goods store. Why not chain drunk tanks and let us make the dough? <laughs> so we needed some missionaries, subsidized. We needed a chain of drunk tanks. That got very clear. Awful clear to me. Bob is a conservative type of Yankee. I don't think he was quite so fast for those items, but I was very insistent. It would take a pile of dough to finance all this, but after all, with this brand new light shining in our dark world, we just squirted in the eyes of rich guys and laid up with the dough. <laughs> Besides, we reflected, uh, <coughs> we'd have to get some kind of literature. Up to this moment, not a syllable of uh, this program, so far as I know, was in writing. And it was a kind of a word of mouth deal. You, uh, with variations according to each man or woman's fancy. Uh, you, well, in a general way, we said, well, the booze has got you down, boys. And you got an allergy and an obsession, and you're hopeless. If you are, you better get on it with yourself. Take stock. Uh, you ought to talk this out with somebody, kind of a confession, you know. And you ought to make restitution for the harm you did. You ought to make amends and all that kind of business. Well, you prayed as best you could, according to your life, if any. And that was the sum of the word of mouth program up to that time. But as I say, variations on that were already appearing. How could we unify this? Could we, out of our experience, get certain principles, describe certain methods that had done the trick for us? Yes, obviously. If this movement was to propagate, it had to have a literature so its message could not be garbled, either by the drunks or by the general public. So Bob and I reflected that late afternoon in 1937, Missionaries, chain of drunk tanks, and a book. Well, even by then, he and I had begun to learn that we were not the government of Alcoholics Anonymous. He, I guess more than I, already realized that the conscience of the group, the opinion of the group, when it was an informed opinion and in the group's interest could be better than our own. We'd better consult, folks. Well, there was dear old, uh, dear old non-alcoholic and his wife, T. Henry Williams, there in Akron. And they'd let us meet in their house after it got out of the Smith parlor and got into theirs. And he was great friends of ours. So we called a meeting of the Akron group, that is to say, those who had been sober any great length of time, I think for this particular meeting, we scraped up about 18. And that evening, Bob and I told them that we were in, within sight of success, that we thought this thing might go on and on and on, that a new life, indeed, was shining in our dark world. But how could this light be reflected and transmitted without being distorted and dark? And at this point, they turned the meeting over to me, and being a salesman, I set right to work on them drunk tanks and subsidies for the missionaries. I was pretty poor then. And we touched on the book. But and the group conscience consisted of 18 men, good and true. And the good and true men, you could see right away, were damn skeptical about it all. <laughs> Almost with one voice, they chorus, let's keep it simple. <laughs> this is going to bring money into this thing. This is going to create a professional class. We'll all be ruined. Well, I countered, that's a very good argument. 
lots to what you say. But even within gunshot of this very house, alcoholics are dying like flies. And if this thing doesn't move any faster than it has in the next in the last three years, it may be another ten before it gets to the outskirts of Akron. How in God's name are we going to carry this message to others? We've got to take some kind of chance. We can't keep it so simple it becomes an anarchy and gets complicated. We can't keep it so simple it won't propagate itself. And we got to have a lot of money to do these things. So exerting myself to the utmost, which was considerable in those days, we finally got a vote in that little meeting, and it was a mighty close vote by just a majority of maybe two or three. The meeting said with some reluctance, well, Bill, if we need a lot of dough, you better go back to New York, where there's plenty of it, and you raise it. <laughs> well, boy, that was the word I'd been waiting for. So I scrammed back to the great city, and I began to approach some people of means and describe this tremendous thing that had happened. And it didn't seem so tremendous as the people of means at all. He said, what, 35 or 40 drunk? Sobers up? They have sobered him up before now, you know. And besides, Mr. Wilson, don't you think it's kind of sweeping up the shavings? I mean, uh, I mean, wouldn't the, something for the Red Cross be better? In other words, with all of my most ardent solicitation, I got one hell of a freeze from the gentleman of wealth. Well, I began to get blue. And when I began to get blue, uh, my stomach kicked up as well as other things. <coughs> And I was laying in bed one night with imaginary ulcer attacks. Used to have them all the time. I had one at the time to swell step for it. And I said, my God, uh, we're starving to death here at Clinton Street. By this time, the house was full of drunks. They were eating us out of house and home. In those days, we never believed in charging anything for uh, anybody for anything. So Lois was earning the money. I was being a missionary, and the drunks were eating the meals. <laughs> This can't go on. We got to have them drunk tanks. We got to have them missionaries. And how we got to have them missionaries. And we got to have a book. That's for sure. Well, the next morning, I crawled into my clothes and I saw my brother in law. He's a doctor and he is about the last person who stopped me when the ship is way, way down. The only one, save, of course, dear Lord. Well, I said, I'll go up and see Len. So I went up to see my brother-in-law, Leonard. He pried out a little time between the patients coming in up there. And I started my awful bellyache about these rich guys who wouldn't give us any dough for this great and glorious enterprise. So well on its way. And it seems to me that somehow he was tied up with the Rockefeller family in their charity. And if you want to, we'll call up the Rockefeller offices and see if there is such a man, and if there is, is he alive, and will he see us? Would you like me to do that? Well, I hadn't tried the Rockefeller offices, so I said, well, sure, give him a ring. <laughs> On what slender threads our destiny sometimes hangs. Remember, my brother-in-law said, I knew a girl, and I think she had an uncle. <laughs> so the call was made. Instantly, there came onto the other end of the wire the voice of dear Willard Richards, one of the loveliest Christian gentlemen that I have ever known. And the moment he recognized my brother-in-law, he said, why, Leonard, he said, where have you been all these years? Well, my brother-in-law, unlike me, is a man of very few words, so he quickly said to dear old Uncle Willard uh, that uh, 
He had a brother-in-law who was apparently having some success sobering up drunks. And could uh, the two of us come over there and see him? Why, certainly, said Dear Willard, uh, come right over. So we go over to Rockefeller Plaza, we go up that elevator, 54 flights, 56, I guess it is, and we walk plump into Mr. Rockefeller's personal offices, asked to see Mr. Richards. And here sits this lovely, benign old gent, who nevertheless had a kind of a shrewd twinkle in his eye. So I sat down and told him about our exciting discovery. This terrific cure for alcoholics that had just hit the world. How it worked. What we had done about it. And boy, this was the first receptive man with money or access to money. Remember, we were in Mr. Rockefeller's personal office at this point. And by now, too, we had learned that this was Mr. Rockefeller's closest personal friend, perhaps. So he said, why, yes, he said, I'm much interested. Uh, wouldn't you like to have lunch with me, Mr. Wilson? Well, now you know for a rising promoter, that sounded pretty good. You're going to have lunch with best friends of uh, John D. Things were looking up. My ulcer attack disappeared. <laughs> So I have lunch with the old gentleman, and we go over this thing again, and boy, he's so warm and kind and friendly. Right at the close of lunch, he said, well, now, Mr. Wilson, or Bill, if I can call you that, uh, said, wouldn't you like to have a larger meeting with uh, some of my friends? And there's Frank Amos. He's in the advertising business, but he was on a committee that recommended Mr. Rockefeller uh, drop the... Uh, prohibition business. And there's Leroy Chipman. He looks after Mr. Rockefeller's real estate. And there's Mr. Scott. He's chairman of the board up at the Riverside Church. And he said a number of people like that. I, I believe they'd like to hear this story. So a meeting was arranged, and it fell upon a winter's night, late 1937. And the meeting was at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, we called in post haste a couple of drunks, Macron, Smithy included, of course, heading the procession. I came in with the New York contingent, four or five, and to our astonishment, we were ushered into Mr. Rockefeller's personal boardroom, right next to her office, right next to his office. And I thought to myself, well, now, this, this is really getting hot. And indeed, I felt very much warm when I was told by Mr. Richardson that I was sitting in a chair just vacated by Mr. Rockefeller. And I said, well, now, we really are getting close to the bankroll. <laughs> Old Doc Silkworth was there that night, too. And he testified what he had seen happen to these new friends of ours. And each drunk, thinking of nothing better to say, well, each of us told our stories, drinking and the recovery. And these folks listened. They seemed very definitely impressed. So I could see that the moment for the big touch was coming. <laughs> so I gingerly brought up the subject of the drunk tanks, the subsidized missionaries, and this question of a book or literature. Well, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. But it didn't look like a wonder to me when Mr. Scott, head of a large engineering firm and chairman of the Riverside Church, uh, looked at us and said, but uh, gentlemen, that up to this point, this has been the work of goodwill only. No plants, no properties, no paid people, 
just one carrying the good news to the next. Isn't that true? And may it not be that that is where the great power of this society lies. Now, if we subsidize it, might it not alter its whole character? We want to do all we can. We're gathered for that. But what if we want? Well, then the salesmen all gave Mr. Scott the rush. And we said, what? <coughs> Mr. Scott, there are only 40 of us. It's taken three years. Why, millions, Mr. Scott, will rot before this thing ever gets to them unless we have money and lots of it. And we made out our case at last with these gentlemen for the missionaries, the drunk tank, the vote. So one of them volunteered to investigate us very carefully. And since poor old Dr. Bob was harder up than I was, and since the first group and the typical community situation was in Akron, we directed their attention out there. And Frank Amos, still a trustee in the foundation, at his own expense, got on a train, went out to Akron, made all sorts of preliminary inquiries around town about Dr. Bob. All the reports were good, except that he was a drunk, <coughs> had recently got over. He visited the little meeting out there. He went to the Smith's house. And he came back with what he thought was a very modest project. And he recommended to these friends of ours that, uh, well, we should have at least uh, just a token amount of money at first, say $50,000, something like that. That would clear off the mortgage on Smith's place. It would uh, get us a little rehabilitation place. We could put Dr. Smith in charge. Uh, we could subsidize a few of these people uh, briefly until we got some more money. Or we could, uh, you know, it would start the chain of hospitals. And we'd have a few missionaries. And we could get busy on the book. All for mere 50000 bucks. Well, considering the kind of money we were backed up against, that did sound a little small, but, you know, one thing leads to another, and it sounded real good. We were, we were real glad. Mr. Willard Richardson, our original contact, then took that report into John Day. Junior, as everybody called him. And I've since heard what went on in there. Mr. Rockefeller read the report, called Willard Richardson back, and he said, somehow I am strangely stirred by all this. This interests me immensely. And then looking at his friend Willard, he said, but isn't money going to spoil this? I'm terribly afraid that it was. And yet I'm so strangely stirred by it. Then came another turning point in our destiny. When that man whose business is giving away money said to Willard Richardson, No, he said, I won't be the one to spoil this by, with money. You say these two men who are heading it are a little strapped. I'll put $5,000 in the Riverside Church Treasury. You folks can form yourselves into a committee and draw on it as you like. But please don't ask me for any more. But I want to hear what goes on. Well, the 50000 is then shrunk to five. We raised the mortgage on Smithy's house. For about three grand, that left two, and Smithy and I commenced chawing on that two. Well, that was a long way from a string of dark drunk tanks, books, and missionaries. What in thunder would we do? Well, we had more meetings with our newfound friends. Amos, Richardson, Scott, Chipman, and those fellows who stuck with us 
to this day, some of them now being gone. <laughs> and in spite of Mr. Rockefeller's advice, we again convinced these folks that this thing needed a lot of money. What could you do without it? So, one of them proposed, well, why don't we form a foundation, something like the Rockefeller Foundation? Well, I said, I hope it'll be like that with respect to money. <laughs> and then one of them got a free lawyer from Ely Hill Roots firm who was interested in the thing. And we are asked him to draw an agreement of trust a charter for something to be called the Alcoholic Foundation. Why we picked that one, I don't know. I don't know whether the foundation was alcoholic. It was the Alcoholic Foundation, not the Alcoholic Foundation. You know. And the lawyer was very much confused because in the meeting in which we formed the foundation, we made it very plain that uh, we drunks did not wish to be in the majority. We felt that there should be non-alcoholics on the board, and they ought to be in a majority of one. Well, indeed, said the lawyer, what is the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic? And one of our smart drunks says, well, that's the thing. A non-alcoholic is a guy who can drink, and an alcoholic is a guy who can't drink. Well, said the lawyer, how do we state that legally? I wouldn't know. <laughs> so at length, we had a foundation and a board, which I think then was of about seven, consisting of four of these new friends, including my brother-in-law, Mr. Richards, and Chipman Amos, and some of us drunk. I think Smithy went on the board, but I kind of coyly stayed off it, thinking, it, well, it would be more convenient later on. So we had this wonderful new foundation. These friends, unlike Mr. Rockefeller, were told that we needed a lot of dough. And so our salesmen around New York started to solicit, solicit the money. Again, from the very rich. And we had a list of them. And we had credentials and letters from friends of Mr. John D. Rockefeller. How could you miss? I asked you, sir. The foundation had been formed in the spring of 1938, and all summer we solicited the rich. Well, they were either in Florida, or they preferred the Red Cross, or some of them thought the drunks were disgusting. And we didn't get one damn cent in the whole summer of 1938, praise God. Well, meantime, we began to hold trustee meetings, and they were commiseration sessions on getting no dough. What with the mortgage and what with Smithy and me eating away at it, the five grand had about gone up the flu, and we were all stony broke again. Smithy couldn't get his practice back either because he was a surgeon, and nobody liked to be carved up by an alcoholic surgeon, even if he was three years old. So things were tough all around, no fool. <laughs> well, what would we do? So one day, probably in August 1938, I produced at a foundation meeting <coughs> a couple of chapters of a proposed book in rough and in mimeograph. As a matter of fact, we've been using chapters of this proposed book along with some recommendations of a couple doctors down at John Hopkins to try to put the bite on the wreck. And we still had these two book chapters kicking around. And so Frank Amos said, well, now I know the religious editor down there at Harvard, old friend of mine, Gene Axman. He said, why don't you take these two book chapters, your story and the introduction to the book, down there and show them to Gene see what he thinks about. So I took the chapters down. To my great surprise, Gene, who has since become a great friend of ours, looked at 
chapters and he said, why? He said, Mr. Wilson, he said, could you write a whole book like this? Said, oh, I said, sure, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, there was more talk about it. Uh, I guess he went in and showed it to Mr. Canfield, the big boss. Now, the meeting was had, and the upshot was that Harper's intimated that they would pay me as the budding author $1,500 in advance royalties, bringing enough money in to enable me to finish the book. Well, I felt awful good, you know, about that. It made me feel like I was an author, a comer, maybe. I felt real good about it. But after a while, not so good. Because I began to reason, and so did the other boys, well, if this guy Wilson eats up the 1500 bucks while he's doing this book, after the book gets out, it'll take a long time to catch up, and if this thing gets some publicity, what are we going to do with the inquiries? And after all, what's a lousy 10% royalty anyway? Well, the 1500 still look pretty big to me. Then we thought, too, now here's a fine publisher like Harper's, but if this book, if and when done, should prove to be the main textbook for AA, why would we want our main means of propagation in the hands of somebody else? Shouldn't we control it? Well, at that point, the book project really began to get hot. It began to take off. Why? We said what we ought to do is to form a book company a publishing company, a corporation. We could call it, let us say, Works Publishing Company, this being the first of a great many works, you see. And we could sell stock certificates to all the drunks, get some money coming in, which support the author and the guy who collected the money and the gal who would help me on the book while this was going on. Well, we took this idea in the next trustees meeting and they all shook their heads, and they went out and made some more inquiries, and we had another trustees meeting. They'd gone to some publisher friends, and the publisher said, well, these authors, they all got the crazy idea that they can uh, publish their own books, but it ain't so. We don't believe it. Well, then we had kind of an alcoholic rebellion. We said to our friends, well, after all, you didn't produce any dough. Uh, we think we'll try this on separate from the foundation. So I had a guy helping me on this thing who had red hair, ten times my energy, and some promoter he was. He said, Bill, this is simple. Come on with me. We walk into a stationery store. We buy a pad of blank stock certificates. We write across the top of them, Works Publishing Company, par value, $25. So we take a pad of these stock certificates. <laughs> Of course, we didn't bother to incorporate it. That didn't happen for several years. <laughs> we took this pad of stock certificates to the next AA meeting, where you shouldn't mix money with spirituality at home. And we said to the drunks, why, look, this thing is going to be a cinch. Parker, he'll take a third of this thing for services rendered. I, the author, I'll take a third for services rendered. And you can have a third of these stock certificates, part 25, if you'll just start paying up on your stock. If you only want one share, it's only $5 a month for five months, see? And the drunks all gave us a stony look. They said, what the hell? You mean to say you're asking us to buy stock in a book that you ain't written yet? Why, sure, we said. If Harper's will put money in this thing, why shouldn't you? Harper says it's going to be a, a good book. But the drug still gave us the stony stare. No stop. Well, we had to think up some more arguments. So we said, well, uh, we've been looking about the printing cost of the books, boys. We get a book here, you know, 400, 450 pages, it ought to sell for about 350. <coughs> now, back in those days, uh, we found on inquiry from printers that 
that 350 book could be printed for 35 cents, making a thousand percent profit. Of course, we didn't mention the other expenses, just printing costs. So, boy, just think of it. When these books move out in Carlo's lot, <laughs> we're printing them for 35 cents and we're selling them direct mail. 350. How can you lose? The drunk still gave us the stony stare. No, stop. Well, we figured we had to have a better argument than that. Harper said it was a good book. You, we could print them for 35 cents and sell them for 350. But how are we going to convince the drunks that we could move carload lots? Millions of dollars. So we get the idea we'll go up to the Reader's Digest. And we got an appointment with Mr. Kenneth Payne, the managing editor up there. Gee, I never forget the day we got off the train up to Pleasantville and went over to his office, ushered in. We excitedly told him the story of this wonderful budding society. We dwelled upon the friendship of Mr. Rockefeller and Harry Emerson Fosdick. You know, we were traveling in good company, Mr. Payne. And uh, the society, by the way, was about to publish a textbook, then in process of being written. And we were wondering, Mr. Payne, uh, if this wouldn't be a matter of tremendous interest to the Reader's Digest. Having in mind, of course, that the Reader's Digest had a circulation of 12 million readers. And if we could only get a free ad of this coming book in the Reader's Digest, we really would move some, you see. <laughs> well, Mr. Payne said, this sounds extremely interesting. And I'm, I, I, I like this idea. Why? I think it will be an absolutely ideal, <coughs> ideal piece for the digest. Why, how soon do you think this new book will be out, Mr. Wilson? Well, I said, we've got a couple chapters written. And <laughs> <laughs> said, uh, if we can get right at it, Mr. Payne, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, this being, let us say, October, we ought to get this out by next April, next May. Why, Mr. Payne said, I, I'm, I'm sure that I just would like a thing like this, Mr. Wilson. He said, I'll take it up with the editorial board. And he said, uh, when the time is right and you get all ready to shoot, come on up and we'll put a special feature writer on this thing and we'll tell all about your society. And then my promoter's friend said, but Mr. Payne, will you mention the new book in the piece? Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Payne mentioned the new book. That's all we need. Then we went back to drunks and said, now look, boys, there are positively millions in this. How can you make it? Harper says it's going to be a good book. We buy them for 35 cents from the printer. We sell them for 350. The Reader's Digest is going to give us a free ad in a piece, and boys, they'll move out by the carlo. How can you miss? And after all, we only need four or five thousand bucks. So then we began to sell the shares that were publishing, not yet incorporated, par value twenty-five dollars, five dollars a month to poor people. Some people could buy as many as. One guy bought 10 shares. We sold a few shares to non-alcoholics. And my promoter friend, who was to get a third interest, was a very important man in this transaction because he went out and kept collecting the money from the drunks so that little Ruthie Hawk and I could keep working on the book and so Lois would have some groceries, although she was still working in that department store. <laughs> so the preparation started. And some more chapters were done, and we went into AA meetings in New York with these chapters in the rough. Well, it wasn't like chicken in the rough. The boys didn't eat those chapters up at all. I was just the umpire. I finally had to stipulate, well, boys, uh, over here you got the holy rollers who say we need all the good old-fashioned up in the book, and over here you tell me we got to have a psychological book, and that never cured anybody, and they didn't do much with drugs in the mission, so I guess you'll have to leave me just to be the umpire. I'll scribble out some rocks here and show them to you, and let's get the comments in. So we fought, bled, and died our way through one chapter after another, 
We sent them out to Akron, and they were peddled around, and there were terrific hassles about what should go in this book and what not. Meanwhile, we set drunks uh, writing their stories or having newspaper people that we had uh, write stories for them to go in the back of the book. We had an idea we'd have a text, you know, and then we'd have stories all about the drunks who were staying sober in the back. Move it up. So then came that night when we were up around that about chapter 5. As you know, I'd gone all on about myself, which was natural after all. And, and then uh, we did a little introductory chapter, and we dealt with the agnostic, and we described alcoholism. But, boy, we finally got up to the point where we really had to say what the book was all about and how this deal worked. Well, as I told you, this was a six-step program then. On this particular evening, I was lying in bed in Clinton Street wondering what the deuce this next chapter would be about. And the idea came to me, well, we need a definite statement, a concrete principle that these drunks can't wiggle out from. Can't be any wiggling out of this deal at all. <laughs> and this six-step program has two big gaps in between. They'll be wiggling out. Moreover, if this book goes out to distant readers, they have got to have an absolute explicit program by which to go. Well, while I was thinking these thoughts, and while my imaginary ulcer was painting me, and while I was mad at hell as these drunks because the money was coming in slow, some had to stop and weren't paying up, a couple of guys come in and they gave me a big argument, and we yelled and shouted. And I finally went down and laid on the bed with my ulcer, and I said, poor me. Well, it was a pad of paper by the bed, and I reached for that, and I said, well, now you've got to break this program up into small pieces so they can't wiggle out. So I started right, trying to bust it up into little pieces. And when I got the pieces set down on that piece of yellow paper, I put numbers on them and was rather agreeably surprised when it came out at 12. I said, well, that's a good significant figure in Christianity and mystic lore. <coughs> then I noticed that instead of leaving the God idea to the last, I'd got it up front, but I didn't pay much attention to that. It looked pretty good. Well, the next meeting comes along. I'd done on, gone on beyond the steps, trying to amplify them in the rest of that chapter, and I took that chapter with the steps in the meeting, and boy, pandemonium broke loose. What do you mean by changing the program? What about this? What about that? This thing is overloaded with God. We don't like this. You got these guys on their knees. Stand them up. <laughs> this thing is... A lot of these drunks are scared to death of being God, but let's take God out of his power. Such were the arguments we had. Well, out of that terrific hassle about the 12 steps, there did come a 10 strike. That argument caused the introduction of a phrase which has been a lifesaver by thousands. It was certainly not a idol. I was on the pious side then, you see, still suffering from this big hot flash of mine. The idea of God as you understand him came out of that perfectly ferocious argument. And we put that into the steps. Well, little by little, the thing ground down, and little by little, the drunks put in the money, and we kept an office open over in Newark, which was the office of a defunct business that I've tried to establish my friend in. The money ran low at times, though, and little Ruthie Hawk worked for no pay. We gave her Plenty of stock in the works publishing, of course. You know, all you had to do was tear it off the pad, par 25, have a week's salary right here. <laughs> so we got around to about January 1939. Somebody said, well, and we better test this thing out. And we better kind of make a pre-publication copy, a monolithic or a mimeograph copy of this text and a few of these stories that have come in try it out, you know, on the preacher, on the doctor, Catholic Committee on Publications, psychiatrists, policemen, fishwives, housewives, drunk, everybody, just to see if we got anything that goes against the grain any place, and also to find out if uh, 
We can't get some better ideas here. So at considerable expense, we got this pre-publication copy made, and we peddled it around, and the comments came back. Some of it very helpful. It went, among other places, to the Catholic Committee on Publications in New York. And at that time, we had only one Catholic member to take it there, and he just got out of the asylum and hadn't had anything to do with, publish, uh, with uh, preparing the book. And to our great surprise, it's a promising people something for later on. <laughs> Well, so the book had passed much, and the stories came in, and somehow we got them edited, and somehow we got the galley together, we got up to the printing contract. Well, meanwhile, the drunks had been kind of slow on those subscription payments. The thing a little further on, I was able to go up to Charlie Town, where old Doc Silkworth held forth. Charlie believed in us mightily, and so we had put the slug on Charlie for 2500 bucks. Charlie didn't want any stock. He wanted a promissory note. On the book, not yet written. So we tapped Charlie for 2500 which we rooted around through the Alcoholic Foundation so it could be tax exempt, you understand? So all told, we had blown in, supporting three of us in an office to do this job in these nine months. Upwards of $6,000, and the money of the till was getting very low. Well, we still had to get it printed. So we go up to Cornwall Press, the largest printer in the world, where we had made previous inquiry, and we asked about printing, and, uh, oh, yes, they'd be very glad to do it, and uh, how many books would we like? Well, we said, that's very hard to estimate. Of course, our membership is very small at the present time. We won't sell many of the membership, but after all, the Reader's Digest is going to print a plug about it to 12 million readers. This book should go out in Carlos, Mr. Printer. And Mr. Printer was none other than dear old Mr. Blackwell, one of our great friends. And Mr. Blackwell said, well, boys, uh, how much of a down payment uh, on a How many books would you like printed? Well, we said we'll be conservative. We'll, we'll, let's print 5,000 of them just to start. And Mr. Blackwell said, well, what are you going to use for money? Well, we said, well, we won't need much. I imagine a few hundred dollars on account. Be all right with you, Mr. Blackwell. Of course, after all, we're traveling very good company. You know, our friends, Mr. Rockefeller and all that. So Blackwell started printing the 5,000 books. The plates were made and the galleys were read. Gee, all of a sudden we thought of the Reader's Digest. So we go up to the Reader's Digest, we walk in on Mr. Kenneth Payne, and we said, Mr. Payne, we're all ready to shoot. And Mr. Payne said, shoot what? <laughs> Oh, yes, he said. I remember you, Mr. Parkerson, Mr. Wilson. You were the gentleman up here last fall. He said, I told you that I thought the Reader's Digest would be interested in this new work and in this book. But he said, right after you were here, I consulted our editorial board, and to my great surprise, they didn't like the idea at all, and I forgot to tell you. <laughs> Boy, we had the drunks with... 4,500 bucks in it. Charlie Towns hooked for 2,500 bucks. On the cuff with the printer. Maybe $500 left in the bank. What in the deuce would we do? Well, this fellow Morgan Ryan, the good looking Irishman that had taken the book uh, over the Catholic Committee on Publications, had been in earlier time, a good ad man. He said, I know Gabriel Heater. And Gabriel Heater is putting on these three-minute uh, heart plug uh, programs on the radio. He said, I'll get an interview with Gabriel Heater. Maybe he'll interview me on the radio about all this. So our spirits rose once again. 
And then all of a sudden, we had a big chill. We thought, well, supposing this Irishman got, got drunk before he and her interviewed him. <laughs> so he went over to see Heater, and lo and behold, Heater would interview him. And then we got still more scared. So we rented a room in the downtown athletic club, and we put Ryan in there with a day and night guard for 10 days. <laughs> Boy, our spirits rose again. We could see those books just going out in Carmel. <laughs> then my promoter friend said, well, look, there should be, a, you know, a follow-up on a big thing like this Heater interview. He said, it'll be heard all over the country, national network. And now he said, I think, folks, that the big market for this book are the doctors, the physicians. And he said, I suggest that we pitch the last $500 we got in the Treasury on a postal card show, going to every physician east of the Rocky Mountains. And on the postal card, we will say, hear all about Alcoholics Anonymous on Gabriel Heater's program. Send 350 for the book Alcoholics Anonymous, short cure for alcoholism. <laughs> So we spent the last $500. The postal card shower went out. They managed to keep Ryan sober, although he since hasn't made it. All the drunks had their ears glued to the radio. The group market in Alcoholics Anonymous was already saturated because, you see, we had 49 stockholders, and they all got a book free. And then we had 28 guys with stories, and they all got a free book, so we'd run out the AA market. But we could see it moving out in carloads to these doctors and their patients. Sure enough, Ryan is interviewed, Peter pulls out the old tremolo stop, and we could see them book orders coming back in carloads. Well, we just couldn't wait to go down to old post office box 658, Church Street Annex, the address printed in the back of the old book. We hung to it for about three days, and then my friend Hank and little Ruthie Hawk, that some of you remember, and I went over, and we looked in box 658. It wasn't a lock box. You just looked through the glass. And we could see in there a few of these postal cards. I had a terrible sinking sensation. But my friend, the promoter, he said, boy, Bill, he said, they can't put all that stuff in the box. He said, they got mailbags full of it out here. <laughs> so we go to the clerk. And he brings us out 12 lousy postal cards, 10 of them completely illegible, written by doctors drunk as monkeys, and we had exactly two orders for the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and we were absolutely and utterly stony broke. The sheriff then moved in on the office. Poor old Mr. Blackwell wondered what to do for money and felt like taking the book over. And at that very opportune moment, the house in which Lois and I lived where it was foreclosed, and we and our furniture were set out in the street. And that was the state of the book Alcoholics Anonymous in the summer of 1939, and the state of grace that the Wilsons were in. Moreover, a great cry went up from the drunks, what about our $4,500? And Charlie, uh, who was pretty well off, was even a little uneasy about that note for $2,500. What would we do? What would we do? Well, we put our goods into storage on the car. Couldn't even pay the drayman. 
An AA lent us a summer camp. Another AA lent us a car. The folks around New York began to pass the hat for groceries for the Wilsons, for which they supplied us $50 a month. So we had a lot of discontented stockholders. 50 bucks a month, a summer camp and an automobile, with which to revive the falling fortunes of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. We began to shop around from one magazine to another. Would they give us some publicity? Nobody bit, and it looked like the whole dump was going to be foreclosed. Book, office, Wilson's, everything. When one of the boys in New York, who happened to be a little bit prosperous at the time, and who had a fashionable clothing business on Fifth Avenue, which we learned was mostly on mortgage, having drunk nearly all of it up, one of those guys, Bert Taylor, saved us. I went to Bert one day and I said, Bert, there is a promise of an article in Liberty Magazine. I just got it today. But it won't come out until next summer, uh, next September. It's going to be called Alcoholics and God. It'll be printed by Liberty Magazine, Fulton editor, the, uh, the, 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 uh, for Fulton Housler, the then editor. And Bert, when that piece is printed, why, these books will go out in carload lots. We need a thousand dollars real bad to get us through the summer. Well, Bert says, you're, you're sure that article's going to be printed, aren't you? Oh, yes, that's possible. Well, he said, okay. He says, I haven't got the dough, but he said, this man down in Baltimore, Mr. Cochran, he's connected with the wet and dry forces. And, uh, well, I said, Bert, this wet and dry, I guess. Bert said, you ain't going to be fussy where you get this stuff. <laughs> he's a customer of mine. He buys his pants in here. <laughs> Let me call him up. So Bert gets on long-distance phone with Mr. Cochran Baltimore, a very wealthy man, and he said, Mr. Cochran, he said, time to time, he said, I mentioned this alcoholic fellowship to which I belong. Mr. Cochran said, yes, yes, Mr. Taylor. Well, uh, Bert said, Mr. Cochran, our fellowship has just come out with a magnificent new textbook, Sure Cure for Alcoholism. Mr. Cochran, it's something that we think that every public library in America should have. And Mr. Cochran, the retail price of the book is two fifty. But he, Mr. Cochran, if you just buy a couple of thousand of those books and put them in the large libraries, uh, of course we would sell for that purpose at a considerable discount. Well, Mr. Cochran said he didn't think he'd uh, care to do that. And then uh, Bert said, "Well, Mr. Cochran, uh, some publicity has come out about." will come out next fall about this new book, Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, in the meantime, the books are moving rather slow, and we need, uh, say, a thousand dollars to tide us over. And uh, would you loan the Works Publishing Company a thousand dollars? Well, said Mr. Cochran, what does this balance sheet look like, this Works Publishing Company? <laughs> And after he learned what the works publishing looked like, Mr. Cochran said, no thanks. <laughs> so then Bert said, well, now, Mr. Cochran, you know me. Would you loan the money to me on the credit of my business? Why, certainly, Mr. Cochran said, send down your note, Mr. Taylor. So Bert hocked the business that a year or two later was to go broke anyway, to save the book Alcoholics Anonymous, turned the $1,000 over to us, we lasted till the Liberty article came in. A thousand inquiries, 800 inquiries came in as a result of that. We moved a few books. We barely squeaked through the year 1929. But in all this period, we'd heard nothing from John D. Rockefeller. Meanwhile, there'd been foundation meeting after foundation meeting. Too bad we were having such a hard time, but no dough. When all of a sudden, in I, about February 1940, Mr. Richardson came to a trustees' meeting, and he said, I have great news. <coughs> Mr. Rockefeller, who we hadn't heard from since 1937, we were told had been watching all the time with immense interest. Moreover, Mr. Rockefeller would like to give this fellowship a dinner, to which he 
would invite his friends to see the beginnings of this new and promising style. And then Mr. Richardson produced the invitation list. And oh, here was the president of the Chase Bank and Wendell Wilkie and uh, all kinds of very prominent people, many of them extremely rich. I mean, a quick look at the list, uh, I figured it would add up to a couple of billion dollars. <laughs> so we thought maybe, you know, I'd laugh, you know, there would be some money inside. So the dinner came. And we got Harry Emerson Fonzie, who had reviewed the AA book down there. He gave us a wonderful plug. Foster Kennedy came and spoke. On the medical attitude, he'd seen a very hopeless gal, Marty Mann, recover, one of his patients. I got up and talked about life among the anonymi, and the bankers, assembled 75 strong and in great wealth, sat at the table with the alcohol. Well, the bankers had come probably as a sort of a command performance, and they were a little suspicious that perhaps it was another prohibition deal. But they warmed up under the influence of the alcohol. Mr. Ryan, the hero of the here episode, still sober. For example, at his table was asked by a distinguished banker, why, Mr. Ryan, uh, we presume that you are in the banking business. Mr. Ryan said, not at all, sir. I'm just out of Greystone Asylum. <laughs> Well, that intrigued the bankers, and they were all warming up the bond. <laughs> but unfortunately, Mr. Rockefeller couldn't get to the dinner. He was sick, actually quite sick that night. And he sent his son, a wonderful gent, not Nelson Rockefeller, in his place instead. And after the show was over, everybody was in fine form, and we were all ready again for the big touch. Nelson Rockefeller got up and, speaking for his father, said, My father sends word that he is so sorry he cannot be here tonight, but so glad that so many of his friends can see the beginning of this great and wonderful thing. Something, Nelson Rockefeller said, that it affected his life more than almost anything that it cost him. A stupendous plug that was. Then said Nelson, but fortunately, gentlemen, this is a work that proceeds on goodwill. It requires no money. <laughs> Whereupon the two billion dollars got up and walked out. Well, that was a terrific letdown, but we weren't let down very long. Again, the hand of Providence had intervened. Right after the dinner, Mr. Rockefeller asked that the talks be published in a pamphlet. He approached the rather defunct works publishing company and said he would like to buy 400 books to send to all of the bankers who had come to the dinner and all who had not. Well, seeing that this was for a good purpose, we let him have the books cheap. He bought them cheaper than anybody had since. We sold 400 books to John D. Rockefeller, Jr. for one buck apiece to send his banker friends. So, he sent out the book and the pamphlet, and with it he wrote a personal letter and signed every doggone one. And in this letter, he again recited how glad he was that his friends had been able to see this great beginning of what he thought would be a wonderful thing, how deeply it had affected him. <coughs> and then he said, but fortunately, gentlemen, this is a work of good wit. It leaves little, if any, money, perhaps a slight amount of temporary help, I, said John D. Rockefeller, am giving these good people $1,000. So the bankers all received Mr. Rockefeller's letter, and they all tied it up on the cuff. Well, if John D. is giving $1,000, me, with only a few millions, I should send these boys about 10 bucks. I'm dead. 
One who had an alcoholic relative in tow sent us in his highest $300. So with Mr. Rockefeller's $1,000, plus the solicitation of all the rest of these bankers, we got together the princely sum of $3,000, which was the first outside contribution to the Alcoholic Foundation. And that $3,000 was divided equally between Smithy and me so that we could keep going somehow. And we solicited that dinner list for five years and got about $3,000 a year out of it for five years. And at the end of that time, we were able to say to Mr. Rockefeller, we don't need any more money. The book income is helping to support our office. The groups are contributing to fill in. The royalties are taking care of Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson. We don't need any more money. Now you see, Mr. Rockefeller's decision not to give us money saved this society. He gave of himself. He gave of himself at a time when he was under public ridicule for his views about alcohol. He said to the whole world, this is good. The story went out on the wires, all over the world. People ran into the bookstores to get the new book, and boy, we really began to get some book orders. An awful lot of inquiries came into the little office there at Beasy Street. The book money began to pay to answer them. We hired one more help. There was Ruthie, another gal, and me. And then comes Jack Alexander with his terrific article in the Saturday Post. Then came an immense flood of inquiries, six or 7,000 of them, and Alcoholics Anonymous had become a national institution. Such is the story of the preparation book, Alcoholic Synopsis, and of its subsequent effect, you all have some notion. The proceeds of that book have repeatedly saved the office in New York. But it isn't the money that has come out of it that has mattered. It is the message that it carries in it, that has transcended the mouth and the sea, and is even at this moment lighting candles in dark caverns and on distant beaches.